I know you've written you've written scripts, you have plays, stage plays you're working on, and you also have two children's books. So I'm wondering, did you have a parent or grandparent that would like sit you down and read to you and that's where your love of stories developed? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I have one children's book that's published right now with Scholastic. So there are more in the works. I was actually emailing with my editor today. Oh, okay. Oh, well, you had, <laughs> you had two. Okay, maybe I'm just... I, I will have two. It's in the two. ether, I, yeah. I will, I will. Um, but no, my, it's, it's funny. My, my grandmother was sort of the impetus for, for a lot of the things that I have carried through me with my childhood to an adult. Um, I didn't necessarily have a harmonious environment growing up, so she was this sort of escape for me. And I would spend weekends at her house and she would always, you know, come up with the most amazing games and she had books. And I mean, this is, this is pre video games and, you know, technology and things like that. So we would play with board games and books and, uh, she would constantly read to me, constantly read to me. Um, she would constantly encourage me to write and, you know, act things out. And um, she actually was the inspiration for my first children's book too. So um, the the book is called Sleepy Toes, and it's for kids. Now the way that I the way that I started to to write this and how this came to be is um, when I turned 30, I was in a place where I was very, very unhappy with my life. Um, and I decided to do something about it. So I created something called a fuck it list. And I hope I can say that. <laughs> yeah, but, you can. Sure. Okay. So I created, I created my fuck it list mm -hmm. and that was basically, it, it was like a bucket list. And, and yes, there's a, a script about this too. So, um, but the fuck it list was the things that I was afraid to do in my life. And I just thought, you know what? I'm 30. I, I don't have the luxury of letting fear be the deciding factor for what I want to do anymore. So I did things like I took myself to New York, I went on a trip to Asia, I, you know, lost a bunch of weight, and I took my hand at writing a children's book. And it was called uh, Your Feet Are Getting Sleepy. And I had illustrated it myself, and I wrote it, and I self-published it. My background is in, you know, marketing and creative direction, so I packaged this whole thing. Um, I did an audio recording, you know, I had, a, I hired a, a friend of mine from the Groundlings to, to, you know, narrate it. And we, uh, I hired a, a musician to score it, you know, it had like a six minute lullaby afterwards, like to, to play, you know, kids to sleep. And I put all these materials together and I sent it out to every single publisher that I could, you know, think to send it to, you know, anybody that was, op you know, open to queries. And I got very close with one publisher, but they ultimately passed. So I was like, all right, well, this was a very expensive experiment. And four years later, I get a phone call from a woman at Scholastic. And she says, hi, you know, my name is so-and-so. Um, I received your submission all these years ago and my boss no longer runs this department, I do. And I was calling to see if you would be interested in publishing with us. Wow. This is four years after I had, you know, self-published and submitted it. So anybody that says self-publishing doesn't lead to, you know, the result at some point, I, I there not in, there's not all instances where that's applicable. But this, you know, from the time that I made myself do it and got it out there, it unagented, the very first thing that I send out there gets bought by the world's largest publisher. Four years later? Four years later. Unbelievable. Like, like uh, unbelievable. And that sort of kickstarted everything else. And this book, Sleepy Toes, that's what it became. Um, but my grandmother used to do this thing with me, you know, to get me to sleep at night. You know, she'd go, your, your feet are getting sleepy, very, very sleepy. And she'd work her way up, you know, your body until you'd eventually drift off and fall asleep. So I, this is what I had put together into this book. And um, my editor saw the value in it. And over 50,000 copies have been sold now. Um, oh. It's, yeah, it's, it's, act, it's done really, really well. Um, and that's, you know, that opened up the door to so many other things. So I, I think that, you know, it was, it was the heart that went into the story that, that propelled it forward. So it's, it's one thing to just, you know, write something. I mean, and writing kids' books is hard. It's, it's harder than writing screenplays, <laughs> believe it or not. Really? Yeah, um, you know, the, the book is only about 30 pages long. But, you know, from the time that it got acquired to the time that we finished the revisions to the time it got published, that was a six and a half year stretch. We were, I mean, we worked on revisions for the text for this for, for, for months. Um, but yeah, so that's. 
And someone else did the illustrations? This or amazing did? illustrator named Corey Dorfeld uh, did the, the illustrations. Typically, if you're, and this is, this is advice, because I get asked this all the time as a children's book author, do you send illustrations? Should you pay someone to illustrate your stuff for you? No, the answer is no. If you are not inherently an illustrator author, don't pay for someone to do it. And, and don't try to do it yourself because when your publisher actually does take your book, they will match you with somebody. So they, they're the ones that take care of that. But, but if you are an illustrator author, which is a very, that's a hot commodity. So if you have that talent, then by all means market that out, but not if you're just a writer. And so the second book that you're working on, is at what stage is that in right now? There's a, there's a couple. <laughs> so oh, there's a couple, okay. There's, there's a couple. So, so there's a lot of them that are just in logline format. There are some that have been you know drafted out into the first iterations. Um, there's, they're in all the various phases. It would be, it would be unfair for me to pinpoint something right now, but definitely one thing that I always try to do for myself is when I get an idea, I write it down. Like even if it's a silly idea, write it down because you never know when you're going to need to come back to it. And that's kind of where I found myself at right now. So. And where do you keep these ideas? Are they like in a little book or a computer? Um, so I typically put them in a Google sheet. So I, I will write everything in a, in a Google sheet so it's accessible no matter where I'm at. Um, this is another thing that I always make sure that I, I have all of my ideas, pitches, log lines. It, they need to be accessible at any point in time because if you, you, don't, you never know when you're going to be asked to pitch. Um, I was attending an event. Um, we, my, my other project, Daruma, has been, um, we've started partnering with organizations like the Reef Foundation and Respectability and the Rudderman Foundation have, you know, they've, they've taken notice because this features two disabled lead actors, but the movie's not about their disability. We were invited to attend a roundtable event just, just to be there, you know, just as special guests. Um, but this was an event that the Respectability uh, people had put on to help uh, their you know, people, people with actual disabilities in the industry to try to get work and learn what to do. And I'm sitting there in the lobby and, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for this event to start and this gentleman comes up to me and he starts talking. I had no idea that it was the featured speaker. <laughs> so he starts asking me, you know, what, what are you doing here? You know, what, why are you here? And I, I told him about our project and he was like, well, let me see, let me see. And had I not had it on me, I would have missed an opportunity. So always be prepared, always be prepared to have your ideas um, accessible. And also too, you never know, like always be open to, I know in LA it's easy to get closed off because we don't know yeah. what the person's agenda is, but you just never know what someone could actually, might be harmless, you know, and that sounds like it led yeah. to something great. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's not to say, you know, have every interaction and looking at like, what, can, what can that person do for me, but certainly be open and respectful to talking to people. Um, it's very hard if you're shy, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not inherently an outgoing person. That's something that I've had to work on. Um, you know, when you're meeting with different development execs, one of the things that they ask you to do is, you know, to you know, tell me about yourself. That's, that's a huge question that you know, gets asked all the time. What they're doing is they're trying to figure out, is this somebody that we can put in a room with a director? Can I put my producers with them? Can I, can this person be socially competent in that environment or am I going to regret this hiring decision? So this is, this is the first phase of your interview. And you know, I, I learned this from, from when I was acting as well. Your audition doesn't start when you get in the room. Your audition starts the minute you get out of the car because you don't know who you're talking to. You don't know if you bump into somebody, you don't know the receptionist, you know, 20, you know, 15 years later, whatever, maybe, maybe they turn into something. And if you have a negative interaction, it's going to stick with somebody. So positive action interactions can be neutral, but negative interactions, you will have a very hard time recovering from that. Sure. And when they ask you, tell me about yourself, how much time is appropriate? Some people could go on forever. Others be very quick. I think it's really about reading the room. My first general lasted about 45 minutes, which is pretty good. When you, when you read the room, um, you know, if you're in there for 25 minutes or under, you didn't necessarily have the best meeting because it's, they're eager to, to get on to the next thing. So um, if your meetings go for an hour or more, you're, you, you've had a good interaction. I mean, obviously be respectful of their time, 
Um, I met with an executive once who, an hour into our meeting, her assistant knocked on the door and said, your coffee's ready. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like okay. And it turns out that was code. That was a code that the exec had set up with her assistant to make sure that the, you know, the meeting was going well. Her response then dictated the next action. So if they were trying to get me out of the room or something like that, then, then the assistant would have known to have been like, oh, well, your, your call is online too, and they would have canned the meeting. So there's, there's these subtle things that you, know, you, may not, <laughs> you may not inherently know that you need to look out for, but you've got to be able to control your own nerves you know, come in with a couple stories, come in with a couple of anecdotes if that, if that helps you feel better and uh, just be more personable in a room.